Hi everyone, welcome back to the Sunday video. Now today I'm going to talk about direct evolution related to Pfizer. Many of you have already heard about this topic from other more influencing YouTube doctors. I'm going to approach this topic from a different angle because I got my PhD in an area that is closely related to directed evolution and I consider myself an expert in this field. I'm going to explain what directed evolution is and is it really that terrifying? Let's get started. Last week, there was a clip showing a doctor who claimed to be an employee at Pfizer mentioning directed evolution experiment may be happening at their facilities. Pfizer then released a press statement to try to set the record straight, but before we examine what Pfizer really meant in their press release, let's have a general understanding of what directed evolution is. Let me first explain directed evolution in layman's term. Almost all of us have heard the term evolution at the organism level or more precisely, evolution by natural selection, which happens at a very slow pace. The idea of evolution is to improve the fitness of an organism or a species to tackle the changing environment. But directed evolution has added selective pressure toward a specific trade. Humans have long been practicing directed evolution, more commonly known as selective breeding. Farmers and breeders do selectively breed on live stocks and companion animals for more favorable features. Plants and crops are also selectively crossbred to gain more agricultural value. From this old painting, we can see watermelons from 1645 contained very little flesh, but watermelons in today's world are full of delicious red flesh. These changes in the organism are a result of human-directed evolution, and it has created these changes in a fraction of time compared to natural evolution. Most importantly, the results of directed evolution is what the population desires. Now let's think a little deeper. We see the appearance of the organism changed as a result of direct evolutions. Scientists call that changes in the phenotype, which means changes in appearance. But what really has changed at the cellular level? It is all about proteins and enzymes that are expressed within each cell. So behind the scenes, it is the direct evolution of proteins and enzymes. Now let's look at the directed evolution again in a professional way. This explanation are for professional people with some science background. Directed evolution of enzymes and proteins is performed in the laboratory. Scientists use this process to speed up the changes of enzymes and proteins to achieve a specific goal. The protein sequences of a given enzyme and protein are designed to have both well-defined fixed regions and as well as an intended level of randomness to create a different variation that may have the desired functionality. Now, these different versions of protein and enzyme are subjugated to engineered screening and selection strategies. This engineered selection process is iterative during which proteins with undesired performance are discarded and the rest are directed to a specific goal, ultimately produce a functional protein with satisfactory performance level that can bind to the substrate or target very tight, meaning with high affinity and very specific, with high specificity. In fact, the field of directed evolution of enzymes has been awarded the 2018 Nobel Prize for Chemistry, and Dr. Francis Arnold is credited for the advancement of this area. And now perhaps one of the questions is, why Dr. Hahn, myself, is an expert in this area? Why am I qualified to talk about directed evolution? I briefly encountered Dr. Arnold in 2015 at the American Chemical Society meeting in Denver, Colorado. I went to listen to her lecture because my PhD dissertation 
was based on a method called systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment. Now, instead of introducing mutation, I started a selection process with billions of combinations and used direct pressure to screen for binding molecules that are useful for biosensing applications. So I've performed many times of directed evolutions of biomolecules myself. Now, if you are interested in learning more about my research, here is my Google Scholar profile, which contains links to my published work in this field. When directed evolution or selection is being applied to antibody selection, this same methodology can rapidly screen for useful therapeutic antibodies that can target disease markers found in cancers and many other diseases. An antibody drug, Humira or Adalimumab, is an FDA-approved antibody drug for various autoimmune diseases, and this drug was derived using the method I just described. The two scientists, Dr. George Smith and Sir Gregory Winter, were credited for this discovery and are also the co-recipients of the 2018 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. So these examples tell us that directed evolution is not sinister by nature. If you are a loyal viewer and didn't skip all the background talk in the past 5 minutes or so, you should have gained some basic understanding of directed evolution. So now, with that in your mind, let's examine what Pfizer's press release statement has told us. At the very beginning of Pfizer's statement, they immediately dismissed conducting any gain-of-function or directed evolution experiment related to the ongoing development of their COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. They did admit they experimented using the original SARS-CoV-2 virus with both the original spike protein and spike proteins from new variants of concern. However, they did so only after there was public knowledge of the spike protein sequence. So, assuming Pfizer is telling the truth, they did not try to mutate the spike protein to get ahead of the vaccine designing game. Instead, they were only responding to existing variants. But the second part of the press release statement is a little trickier to understand, and I will explain. They admitted using computer simulation or mutated viral main protease to test the efficacy of their Paxlovid. Now, in some cases, a full virus may be engineered to test how the drug works to stop the virus in the laboratory cultural dish. The key statement is that their engineered virus does not contain gain of function, and the mutated main protease is a non infectious part of the virus. They also mentioned it is FDA's requirement to do these experiments, and they were performed in the highest level of a safe environment to prevent accidental release. So, in a simple sentence to sum up, this second part implies they have mutated the main protease protein in the computer or in the petri dish, but it is not a protein that will make the virus more dangerous, and they did it safely under the FDA regulations and requirements. Now the question is, what is the main protease? Is mutating the main protease dangerous or not? It is definitely not an easy question to answer, but to the public, it can create uncertainty, and uncertainty often leads to fear. The main protease is an essential coronavirus protein that helps process or cut a long piece of protein called polyproteins during the viral replication process. Pfizer admitted mutation experiments were done on the main protease. In scenario 1, if a mutation makes the main protease less efficient, the viral replication or the viral cycle will likely be slowed down. However, in scenario 2, if a mutation makes the main protease more efficient in processing viral polyproteins, the virus will be more capable of replicating. As a result, the viral cycle is likely to speed up, meaning they may need less time to increase their number. Could Scenario 2 happen? Pfizer did not tell us in their statement. 
But in this reviewed article tells us that the main protease from SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent for COVID, and the main protease from SARS-CoV-1, the causative agent for the 2003 SARS outbreak in Asia, they are 96% similar, with only two notable amino acid mutations that makes the SARS-CoV-2 main protease a lot more efficient in doing its protein processing job that is crucial for viral replication. So hypothetically speaking, if a research group accidentally introduced one or more mutations that can boost the main protease efficiency, and that protease gene is cloned into a virus or pseudovirus, it could, in theory, lead to a faster viral cycle. A faster viral cycle could mean a more significant increase in viral number or viral load in a given period. Again, I must emphasize that this is a hypothetical situation that warrants caution. There is no direct evidence showing this is happening at any level. The bottom line is that I know this area of research can be very terrifying for the general public. And yes, it indeed has the potential to be very dangerous. But at the same time, the same technology has also led to the discovery of many useful therapeutic antibodies. The purpose of this video is not to further terrify you. At the same time, I'm not here to speak for the industry. You know how frequently I criticize the big farmer. But as an expert in this field, I feel obligated to set the record straight. We need evidence. We should refrain from panicking just because someone said something and the company responded with a press release. We must examine all the evidence that is presented to us very carefully and avoid making premature conclusions. This is why I'm here to serve you all. That is all for this week. I hope I did not bore you too much with this very in-depth science video. Now, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you again next week. And meanwhile, please take care. Bye.